Today on Ancient DOS Games, we're taking a look at Number Munchers, a surprisingly popular math game which went on to spawn several other titles, despite being very simplistic when it comes down to it. Under normal circumstances, this wouldn't make for a very long review, but I have something special planned. Maybe controversial, maybe not, I don't know. It's just something I noticed and couldn't help but elaborate on. So I did, and you'll all get to hear my thoughts on this particular thing later in. But as an edutainment title, this is another one that's done fairly well, and save for a bug I ran into which I believe is related to DOSBox, not the game itself, it's solidly put together and plays very simply. Unlike a lot of edutainment titles though, you can seriously jack up the difficulty in this one, which can make for a much more intense game and even makes it challenging for adults. However, like many decent edutainment titles, it rides the line between edutainment and entertainment pretty precariously, so it doesn't make for a good game to teach with, rather a good game for flexing one's existing mathematical skills, thus reinforcing and strengthening the knowledge that a person would already have. Number Munchers was originally created and released for Apple II computers back in 1986 by the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium, typically shortened to MECC, while the DOS port followed four years later in 1990. It's technically a one-player arcade game, given that the aim of the game is simply to get a high score. It can also run in CGA 4 color, EGA 16 color, and MCGA 256 color graphics modes all at 320 by 200 resolution, but it only supports the PC speaker for sound effects. As for its current release date, it's still commercial and kinda hard to find secondhand, but thankfully, due to low demand, it's not expensive when you do find it. I wasn't able to find any copies of the original floppy disk version, which is the one I have, but later re-releases were going for around $5 to $15. Also keep in mind that there's other games in the Munchers series, so you don't necessarily have to go for this original one if you want such a game with similar gameplay. Not necessarily related to mathematics, either. Before you begin playing Number Munchers, it's a really good idea to set up your difficulty settings because this is incredibly customizable. The game includes a large number of presets to cover basic and advanced math levels for grades 3 through 7, as well as a technically maximized difficulty for grades 8 and above. And I say technically because some of the modes of play in this game have an unusual difficulty curve depending on how you set them up, given the way math works. I'll go more in detail with each individual mode of play. The basic gameplay is that you have a board filled with numbers and you control a green character with a big mouth known as the Muncher. Your goal is to chomp down on all the numbers on the board which fit the description given at the top. You can move to any location you want and chomp a number by pressing spacebar. If you chomp a number which does not fit the description, you lose a life. You have three extra lives and once they're out, chomping another incorrect number ends the game and sends it to the high score tables. You earn an extra life at 1000 points if you have less than three, but if you still have the three lives you started the game with, you do not get an extra one out of 1000 points. Now if the game just came down to picking the right numbers, it wouldn't be so bad. But adding to your troubles are special creatures known as the Troggles. They come in five different varieties, which each have different AI handling for how they move around the board and such. The Troggles are very hungry creatures, so if they catch the Muncher, they'll eat them alive. Unfortunately, they don't move very fast, and you do get some audible and visual warnings before they show up, and occasionally certain squares on the board will gain a protective field for a short while, during which if a Troggle gets caught up by the protective field or tries to enter one, they'll be destroyed. So that's all there is to the basic gameplay. Now to talk about the various kinds of mathematics players will experience. Now before you begin, you get to choose which kind of math you want to deal with from a list of five options. Multiples, factors, primes, equality, and inequality. There's also a sixth option called challenge, which switches between all the other modes of play with every level you clear. Now each mode has its own high score table, which is fine when you keep the difficulty in a certain spot, but there's no separate high score tables for different difficulty settings, which kind of makes sense given the extreme amount of customization available, but also makes it so that an unscrupulous older player can just make the difficulty too easy and just put up ridiculously high scores. 
Now that said, you can lock out the difficulty selections with a password, which kinda helps, but in a way kinda doesn't, since you can't have multiple profiles set up for different grade levels or classrooms in a school which has this game on a network. This is actually a common problem with edutainment titles, which track high scores, so I generally don't consider high score tables a good measure of anything for edutainment software. The first mode of play, multiples, shows you a number, and you have to munch down multiples of that number. Generally speaking, this is perhaps the hardest mode of play. If the base number is something small like 5 or 8, it's pretty easy. But once you start dealing with base numbers like 13 and 17, it gets a lot more challenging. I should also point out, anytime you see me making a mistake while playing this, it's almost always because I'm either thinking too fast, and a few times it's because I accidentally mixed up two different numbers together in my mind trying to calculate things out. One thing with multiples though is that if you know some basic tricks, you can often solve these fairly easily. For instance, whenever you're dealing with a multiple of 3, just add all the individual digits together, and if they add up to a value which is divisible by 3, that number is a multiple of 3. 8 is another easy one. Just subtract the nearest multiple of 40, then see if the remaining value is 0, 8, 16, 24, or 32. So a value of, say, 536. The nearest multiple of 40 would be 520. 536 minus 520 is 16, which is a multiple of 8, so 536 is also a multiple of 8. And this works backwards, too, so if you subtract 536 from 560, the next nearest multiple of 40, you'd get 24, which is again divisible by 8. There's tricks like this for many numbers, but I actually don't know most of them, and I don't think a lot of people do, so yeah, this mode is definitely very challenging, especially if you don't know these tricks. The next method of play is factors, and this mode is fairly well balanced and easy to get into, with smaller numbers being easier to figure out than larger numbers for obvious reasons. The numbers never have a chance to get super huge, and even if they did, many large numbers have a surprisingly small number of factors. If you happen to get a prime number, then the only factors will be 1 and the number itself. Although I think the game prevents prime numbers from showing up in this mode. I might be wrong about that. Actually, the randomization in this game is very clever, as we're going to see in a moment. Next up is the primes mode, which is probably the most straightforward and easiest of them all, since there's virtually no variation for this one, other than how big or small the numbers get. The numbers are either prime, or they're not. So there's no real challenge other than knowing which numbers are prime ahead of time, or being able to figure it out on the fly. The next method of play is equality, where you're given a number at the top, and you have to munch down on simple equations which equal that number. Now this is where things get interesting, because the game is very clever about setting up these equations. In fact, I can sort of tell how they did the randomization just by looking at how these results have been generated. Basically, the randomization produces either a correct equation, a completely wrong equation, or it will sometimes take correct equations and alter them slightly, either by making one of the numbers higher or lower, changing the sign in the equation, or both. This keeps you on your toes, since you might see the numbers and think the equation is correct, but because it's using a multiply symbol instead of an addition symbol, it's actually not. The last method of play is inequality, which is like the equality mode, but even more challenging, because not only will you sometimes be trying to munch equations which do not equal the number at the top, but sometimes you need to munch all equations which are either greater than or less than the given number. This ups the challenge, because you can't simply dismiss equations anymore. You have to check them all to see if the result is greater than, less than, or equal to that number. And now, it's time for me to reveal some disturbing and sinister things. For you see, after playing through this a bunch, I came to notice some curious aspects about this game's more creative moments. And then it suddenly dawned on me, this game is charged with pure, concentrated evil. Well, at least the DOS version. This doesn't mean the game is bad. As we've seen, the game's actually pretty fun, even for an adult. But the evil radiating from this thing doesn't come from the gameplay at all. Rather, from our cast of characters. Well, let's take a look at the Troggles first. These gluttonous little creatures are very single-minded and very determined to munch down on muncher flesh, which is disturbing in its own right, but not inherently evil. No, no. 
What's evil about these things is that they're cannibals. When a troggle moves onto a space occupied by another troggle, they just can't help themselves. They're so hungry and they want to sink their teeth into a muncher so badly that when faced with the living form of a fellow troggle right in front of them, their stomachs get the better of them and they chomp down on their fellow kin, leaving nothing behind. But then, it's hard to blame these troggles, for you see, part of the reason they want to eat the muncher is out of spite for the muncher's superior intelligence. And this is where things take an even darker turn. Let's now turn our scornful gaze over to the muncher himself, whom I've discovered is actually an evil bully who willfully and joyously laughs at the misfortunes of those less intelligent than him. After every three levels, a random cutscene will play out from a selection of five different ones, each featuring a troggle trying to creatively find a way to eat the muncher, Wily e. Coyote style. That, in and of itself, isn't necessarily a bad thing. The muncher then comes along, munches some numbers, and leaves without springing the trap or being hurt in any way. The Truggle then tries to figure out what's gone wrong only to be exploded or otherwise seriously injured by their own trap. And what does the muncher do? Render aid and assistance? No. Call an ambulance given the fractured craniums and third degree burns? Nope. He just stares at the Troggle and laughs, like it's just one big joke that the Troggles are so stupid that they end up almost killing themselves. Now, I've learned that the DOS version has entirely different cutscenes from the Apple II original, so it's very possible that only the DOS version radiates with such an intense level of evil. But still, for all the wacky hijinks and excellent gameplay, I figured it was only right to give you all fair warning of this game's dark and disturbing nature. And no, of course I'm not being serious. I'm just playing fun at this particular quirk of the game's creative content. <laughs> I mean, really, I don't think anyone ever put that much thought into these cutscenes or anything. But you have to admit, it was way too easy to play it all up like that. Overall, Number Munchers is one of those few edutainment titles that still poses a challenge even into adulthood, due to the amount of customization possible with the difficulty selections, and still fun to play whenever you want to flex those math muscles. It's no wonder that it saw many more releases covering many more topics, but some people have created remakes and homages out there online, so you don't necessarily have to buy the original game to get a similar experience. About the only drawback is the same as before with thinking things, in that it's geared more for playtime than as a teaching aid. Which is fine really, just something to keep in mind depending on why you're on the hunt for old retro edutainment titles. Unfortunately, the game seems to glitch up in DOSBox every so often, and I'm not entirely certain why. It seems to be random, but I have noticed that it's far more likely to happen with the Ottawa Max cycle settings or if you change the cycle setting after loading the game. So you want to set a fixed cycles count, and you want to avoid changing the cycles count once the game's loaded up. I recommend a setting of 5000, though if you want the game to play more authentically to how it would have on a period correct computer, then go for a setting of around 1000. The higher setting speeds up some of the gameplay animations and also improves control performance, while the overall gameplay will still play at the correct speed as the game auto-balances the speed as you play. Actually, I think that's that auto-balancing is what's tripping up DOSBox and causing the PC speaker sounds to lock up the gameplay. But again, far less of an issue if you play with a fixed cycles count. Just be aware that it can happen every once in a while. Anywho, that's all for episode 210 of Ancient DOS Games. We've actually got more sinister revelations coming up, as next Saturday is a filler video, and we're going to be covering a somewhat brilliant, devious, yet completely legal practice that a particular shareware vendor was performing with their shareware collection CDs in the 90s. So be sure to tune in on Saturday, April 22nd, to see even more crazy shenanigans unfold before your eyes. Thanks for watching everyone, and special thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Here's a small random set of you guys.